In my former book, Theophilus, first one, I wrote all about Jesus, what Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you going to, at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they asked, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, <coughs> Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120 and said, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. With the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field where he fell headlong, his body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called the field, the, that field in their language, Akodama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it's written about him in the book of Psalms. May his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Begin with John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed. I love this prayer, it's typical Peter. Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over the apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. I don't suppose Peter could really resist having a bit of a of a dick at Judas at that point but it shows how human he was do you remember do you remember that moment you met Jesus we've asked this question before you've heard my story plenty of times but you know I don't think I will ever forget the turmoil leading up to that point of making a decision for Jesus thinking it can't be true having all the difficult questions giving people in a bible study really a hard time and to my shame, actually making rude jokes out of what they were saying. I don't think I'll ever forget the moment when I laid in my bed and, and I just couldn't get away from what had been said. And it was like it was, it was pursuing me. But I don't, I don't think I'll ever forget either that moment when I said the prayer. Thinking that that was it. And then after a period of time, as I mentioned to you before, actually walking into that reality and knowing without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is alive and that he's my saviour. And every single one of us has had a similar experience like that, haven't we? 
And every single one of us at one stage or another says, oh, if I could just recapture the enthusiasm I had when I first believed. No, you don't need to do that. You don't want to do that. See, there's a time in many of our lives, for many of us, where we would like a new beginning. We'd like a fresh start. And as we reflect, we might, might dream about how we would do things difficult, different with the, the hindsight that we now have. And I'm sure that the value of hindsight to many of us would be that we'd make some real crucial changes. I know I would make one or two changes. But actually, that's just wishful thinking, isn't it? It's just dream world. It's impossible to live our lives over again. But there is hope to be had because no matter what stage of life we're at, there's always an opportunity for a new beginning. Such is the grace of God. In fact, a new beginning is our only hope because life moves forward even when we look backwards. What's happened to us in the past, I'm not saying it's not significant, it certainly shaped us into the people that we've become. But it's what's going to happen from this, this moment forward that has to take a priority in our lives. And this is the position of Jesus' followers as we travel through the book of Acts. In the opening scene, we find Jesus ministering to his disciples. And he's helping them to cope with the misunderstandings. He's helping them to cope with the failures and the desertion when things got tough. And this post-resurrection ministry of Jesus... It's the sole purpose of giving them a new, has the sole purpose of giving them a new beginning. He's in the process of actually moving them on from being weak and self-centered and disheartened. And he's making them a new breed of believers, although they don't actually see that. And for 40 days, he has spent his time encouraging them, teaching them and commissioning them. And of course we know that the Holy Spirit is going to come and we know it's going to change them. It's going to turn the world upside down with the message of salvation. We've got an insight. We've got the hindsight of knowing that's going to happen. And there's absolutely no reason why that can't happen to us today. Why it shouldn't be true? Because we participate in the divine nature. Because we know the power of God. Not just in clever ideas and, and bright imagination. But in lives that are really transformed. Lives that make a difference. See, too often we miss the point when we read the book of Acts because we focus in on all the great things that happened. We think about how the church changed. We think about the, the spirit coming on Pentecost and how it, how it changed everyone, how they were speaking in different languages and how everyone thought they were drunk and then Peter stands up and preaches this incredible sermon and suddenly 3,000 are added to that number that day that will be in saved. I mean, fantastic. I don't know how we would cope with that, but they, they managed to cope with that. But by focusing in this way, we actually lose sight of what is actually taking place here. And without realising it, what we do is we sideline the activity of the Holy Spirit and the incredible power affected by him in the early church. Because for them, this was a beginning. A beginning they could never have dreamt about. Because God has got a plan. A new beginning is discovered, and as we trust the plan of God, it's not always easy to follow it, is it? Because in our human logic which is often just the guise for a lack of understanding, a lack of un unanswered, um, lack of answered question. It holds us back. There's a fear of apprehension that we experience of not knowing how God is going to do it, how he's going to work it out. So having faith in God's power to achieve his purposes is actually essential if we're to know the presence and the power of God by his spirit in our midst. Was it Martin Luther who said, God our Father has made all things depend on faith, so that whoever has faith has everything, and whoever does not have faith has nothing. Look at verse 4 to 8. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times and the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. 
And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus never told them how God was going to do it. He didn't tell them what was going to be accomplished. He simply says that God has got a time. He will provide the means by which you can be disciples. I want you to go back to Jerusalem and wait. And we can be sure that this plan wasn't all that exciting, you see, because their logic will be telling them that Jerusalem was the last place they wanted to be. They just crucified Jesus, for goodness sake. Why go back there? Why put ourselves and make ourselves targets? Why do that? It's hostile. Do you remember in John's Gospel, he says, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for the fear of the Jews... They found comfort in each other, but they were hiding. You know, like kids, and they go, you can't see me, isn't it? And then Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. You see, it's the presence of Jesus that makes a difference in all circumstances. When he is there, we can know peace. We can know power, we can know presence, we can know hope, we can know purpose. But it's only when he's there. Otherwise we're just like children with the world and say, you can't see me. You see, life will be so much easier if they'd gone back to Galilee. If they could pick up their old jobs. We could fit right back into the community. We could gossip the gospel. There's a good idea. It's all very plausible, all very sensible, but they were to be witnesses in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit was going to have to do a lot of work to quench their fear. And try to imagine how they were feeling. They've just had three very exciting but very difficult years with Jesus. Jesus was the one who took on the religious authorities, and they must have really enjoyed that. You would have, wouldn't you? You would have, wouldn't you? We'll show them. Jesus was the one who fought the corner for the sick and injured and the infirm. People who were excluded from the temple. Jesus was the one who could engage with anyone at any level. Remember what I said about the leper? He would go to anyone. He was the one who would do that. And it was he who was, had the gift of putting folk at their ease. And then, of course, there was that terrible arrest and execution. None of them want to ever forget that. Then there was the resurrection. And those last five weeks, what have been fantastic. Jesus is back. They can't even kill him. And they've been restored and they've been forgiven. And it looked like everything's going to be bright future. But all of a sudden, there's this instruction and there's almost this commissioning. Hang on a minute. The last time he spoke like this, they killed him. Do we really want to go through that again? Do we really want that pain? Do we want that politics? Give me a job in a bike shop. <laughs> that's exactly, they're in the same position. Let me go back fishing. I could be a great witness when I'm fishing. Oh, could you imagine? I could give 10% of my fish away. They could reason that out because we can all do, all do that. And suspicions, you see, will be aroused. Oh. But being pointed in the direction of Jerusalem, that was really tough. But then... Judea and Sumeria and the ends of the earth, really? That's almost too much to handle for them because, you know, Samaritans are regarded as half-breeds and Gentiles have no more value than a dog. But you see, their experiences have taught them that they've got to think outside of the box. Do you remember when they were travelling and they went in the opposite direction to which they would normally go and they ended up in Samaria? Do you remember the woman at the well? A lady had been in an unfortunate situation where she probably, because the divorce laws were quite loose, had been rejected by four men and she was now on a fifth man. She was probably low regarded by other people. And Jesus sat and talked to her. And then once her life was transformed, she went and told everyone. And when they came for themselves, their lives were transformed. And they'd seen a mini revival happening there, so they knew some work could be done. But then there was another incident. Turn with me, if you would, to, to Matthew chapter 15, just quickly. Matthew 15 and verse 21. 
This is the faith of the Canaanite woman. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus didn't answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. And he answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. And he replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she says, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted and your daughter is healed. And for that moment she was healed and it was a marvellous thing that happened. See, faith is the issue here. <coughs> it's the key. It's understanding that it's by faith alone. It's not about being in Jesus' presence. It's about knowing him and believing him and engaging with him. It's about the integrity of faith, about the reality of faith. And this plan of God was going to change them and it was going to change the world and enable them to be baptized in the Spirit of God. Jesus promised that they would have the power to witness and this would happen when they were baptized in the Spirit. Well, John had used the same expression. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come who is more, one who is more powerful than I, one whose sandals are not, not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, this is a metaphor. It's just a, a figure of speech that's not used to describe all the gifts of the Spirit. Rather, it's used to convey the overwhelming experience of being immersed in the Spirit. The Greek word actually means fully wet. In other words, totally committed to the course. Look at verses 9 through 11. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus has been taken from you up into heaven and he'll come back in the same way that you've seen him go into heaven. Jesus, you see, over the last 40 days have been, days have been appearing and disappearing a lot. But this time there was a kind of finality about it. All the things that had been told over these past years were suddenly happening in front of their very eyes. And Jesus returned to the Father, preparing the way for the Holy Spirit. What does John say elsewhere? But I tell you the truth, it is, not, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. These are Jesus' words. The Holy Spirit would enable believers to do great things. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to my Father. Now these 11 disciples are standing there looking into the sky. I don't suppose that happened very often, actually. People ascending into heaven. And Okay, it's not Star Trek, I promise you it's not. They haven't got a backup plan. There was only one plan and it was absolutely essential that it was followed. The difficult part, as they were shortly to find out, is that following that plan is a difficult one. It's, not, it's easy, you see, to quote Hebrews chapter 11. And even with the benefit of hindsight, it's easy to reflect on the steps that we've taken in the path and talk it past and look at how wonderfully things have come together and see how God has worked. That's great. But when we're, in a, we're faced with a decision that goes against all our instincts of self-preservation, suddenly taking a step of faith is not a great prospect. And it's important for us to realise that these were just ordinary folk who didn't get it right all the time. They were simply folk who believed a promise and knew that they couldn't just wait around for something to happen. But they were, leave, they were learning that they needed to act out their faith. They had to take the step because, you know, even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just stand there. Now we can imagine how we would be all struck by that, just looking into the sky as he's ascended up into heaven. Could you imagine just watching him go? I mean, it's a pretty unusual way for someone to say cheerio, wouldn't you say? Well, you can agree with me if you like. Okay? 
And then I think there's this lovely picture of angels appearing. I don't think they, they look like the classic angel with the wings on the back and all the rest, but they were just men standing there in white. You know, it was angels that announced his birth. It was an angels that announced his resurrection, and now angels are predicting his return. For them, there was this physical presence of Jesus ascending, heavenly beings speaking to them, but the scriptures they'd been taught were suddenly coming alive. And you know what it's like when you first start reading the Bible and it really means something to you? You know when it jumps out the page at you? I was telling you the other day, I was talking to a friend who, and I've been reading, doing my daily reading, and I'd read something in a book next to it. And the two just come together like that. And it was an amazing thing. And he came to my office and said, what's up with you like? I said, come and sit down and listen to this, listen to this. And I read it to him. And he says, well, you know, I might try doing that. I said, what's that? He said, start reading my Bible. You seem to get a lot from it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what's amazing about that is how God does that. You know, and this is where they were. They were suddenly realising they were getting an inkling into what was going to come. But in a couple of weeks, I tell you, their life was going to change so much and nothing would shut them up. And that's how God wants us to be. He wants us to be people that just will not shut up about Jesus. Not necessarily just by the things that we say, but by the things that we do, by our very demeanour. We ooze Jesus. We can't help ourselves. That's where we are meant to be. And granted, there are times when you read the scriptures, you know, and you're going through your daily reading, you're going through Chronicles and you've got a list of names, you know. It's really quite tough, isn't it? And sometimes we, we do need to skip a few chapters, you know. Sometimes it's important for us to go and trace a name and go and find out what God is saying about a name. Actually, I remember, sorry, <laughs> this is an aside here. I was just thinking that um, someone was telling me a story of how I'd been reading through the, one of the genealogies and they said, and Salmon was the father of Boaz, but in America they, they pronounce it booze, you see? <laughs> and someone said, yeah, that's where drinking like a fish comes from. <laughs> but it's not true, honestly, it's not true. That wasn't revealed to me by the Holy Spirit. Okay, okay. But it's interesting, Luke says in his gospel, then they worshipped him. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Why were they happy? Well, I think they were happy because Jesus has just done this seminar with them. And they've had a fantastic time. Yeah. And they think he's actually disappeared for a, a wee while. They think thinking the second time coming is going to be tomorrow. Okay? So they said, oh, right, well, okay, we'll go. So they go off to Jerusalem with great joy. And they spend all that time in prayer. But there's still tomorrow to come, isn't it? The result of their obedience, you see, was renewal. That's what was actually happening. And this is where the church has got to get to. It's got to be a point of renewal. I'm not talking about some of the popular books and everything else that comes out, but a renewal of God's Spirit and an experience of the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, you can't go wrong if we seek to build our life on His plans. It's his, his plans that give us a solid foundation on which to build our lives. Now, throughout the chapter, Acts chapter 1, we see the disciples looking to follow God's plan. They returned to Jerusalem, just as Jesus said. And once they were there, we see this confidence in reality suddenly growing. It's how we talked about the fellowship earlier. Suddenly there were a group of them and they were together. And instead of running, they were regrouping. Amazing. And even for a, a small church, they were pretty big. There was 120 of them. Let's look at um, verses 21 to 26. <coughs> Therefore, says Peter, it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. And beginning with John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, for the one of the... For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. That's a very important verse. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabas, also as Justus and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over the apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots and the lots fell to Matthias. So he was added to the eleven 
apostles. Now these verses are really quite revealing of the fact that the disciples found a new courage as they appoint Judah's successor. But their understanding of the scripture has beginning to develop as well. Recognising that Jesus is the Messiah and then understanding that the Old Testaments were pointing to the coming of the Messiah. And it's interesting how Peter starts using similar texts to which Jesus has been using. Now Peter's understanding clearly came from that. And it may well be the case that during these last weeks, Jesus had opened up some scriptures in a new way so they could understand the purposes of God more clearly. Or don't know what actually happened. You see, nothing happens by chance. It's crucial for us to believe that God has got a plan, that God's plan will succeed. The disciples could always look back to the resurrection, to his ascension into heaven, to be the right hand of God. They could see the fulfillment of God's plan eternally. Now, their faith can sustain them as they wait for the next act of God. And the question has to be asked, what for us is the next act of God? What was the last one? Don't all shout. Are we ready? Are we committed? Are we willing? You see, if we follow God's plan, he can enable us to fulfill his plans according to his timetable. And these first century Christians, they got in tune with God's plan. They understood that they, they couldn't do anything on their own. And perhaps the environment in which they were actually helped them to do that and focused them a wee bit. Because just by saying that you knew Jesus and you followed him actually could mean death. If we're not discovering renewal, maybe it's time that we reevaluate our lives in the light of God's plan. Maybe that brick wall we've come up against is God's way of actually redirecting us. If we're marking time or maybe moving one forward and two back, maybe we've got to rethink our strategy. Because you know, the duty of every soul is not to find freedom but to find your master. See, God has got a plan. But we've got to trust in God's timing. Listen to the last words spoken to the apostles by Jesus in answer to the question. Listen, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now these voice, verses for me anyway are really quite perplexing. Jesus has held this 40 day seminar after his resurrection to teach them about the kingdom. Why have they still got more questions? Jesus simply said, it's not for you to know the times and day. Now for most of us, that just isn't sufficient, isn't it? We don't like piecemeal revelation. But it's God's way of not burdening us with tomorrow. <clears throat> Enough light for today. If they'd have known what God was about to do, they would have done everything in their power to bring it about under their own <laughs> steam. But these plans are not uh, God's business, you see. It's his decision, it's his time. And it has to be said that because he is God, he knows exactly what we're like and our enthusiasm and how we lose sight of the real goals and how we focus on our own. You know, in 1921, there was a, a revival in the Herring Fleet in um, the north of Scotland. They travelled down the, side, uh, the east coast and they go down, went down to Lowestoft and it was a fantastic fishing grounds, Herring Fleet. And the spirit broke out amongst the herring fleet, and it was incredible. Um, <clears throat> and it spread, spread inland very, very quickly. And the amount of people that were coming to know Jesus was just, it was out of this world. The Baptist church in Lowestoft was so full, people were sitting on the windowsills, they were sitting in the aisles, and the minister had to climb over people into the pulpit because people were sitting there. It got so busy that... They had to go, the, the church secretary, people were there an hour early for church. That would be great, eh? Um, they were there an hour early for church, waiting for the, the service to start, just to get a seat, okay? 
And the church secretary would come in and ask if all the Christians would please leave the building so the non-Christians could come in, please. It got so incredible that the man who was preaching, who had been anointed for that season, a man called Brown, he, um, he didn't quite know how he was going to do it. He was being asked to preach here and everywhere, and he was gradually getting worn out. And so what did the local churches do? Churches together said, right, we'll form a committee. <laughs> Dangerous. All for the right reasons. They formed a committee, and they, they, then they looked at, so people would apply to them before they would allow him to go out preaching. Just It was for his own health, you know, it was for his own good, and you can understand the reasoning for that. But that actually wasn't God's plan. And so he was restricted about the places he could go and preach to, and wherever he went, it was a success, and people would become Christians. It was wonderful. But eventually, it slowed down and died a death. And Mr. Brown was known to be visiting a minister's fraternal, and he would sit and cry. And he would say, it's gone. It's gone, the power is gone. And it's reckoned that it's because men tried to organise God's blessing. If only they'd left him be. It might have been that he was going to wear out. Maybe he was going to die. But maybe that would have gone even further. See, there's two types of people. There's those who do the work and those who take the credit. It's better to be a worker because there's less competition there. Jesus simply said to them, I want you to go wait in Jerusalem. How long will we have to wait? How, how will God make it happen? What will he require of us? Questions, questions. He said, just wait. Now, waiting's a terrible thing, isn't it? I don't like waiting. I don't know about you. I can remember our Simon breaking his wrist and taking him to the hospital. I, I took him early. Yeah, fortunately, it happened early. I took him straight to the a &E, and there was no one in there. I thought, this is fantastic. Walked straight in. And they said, do you like to go and take a seat? We've got operating triage, which was quite right. And uh, we sat there for five minutes and... 10 minutes and I just wanted to get out and 15 minutes and suddenly the place started filling up and people started getting ahead of us. And do you know how annoying I felt? I, I know I don't, I, it was so annoying, you know, I mean, I was here first. I just want to get on with my life. And sometimes our spiritual life is just like that. We feel that we are, we're on hold. We feel that progress is at a minimum and we want to just get on. We know God's promises, we know that he's got a plan, and we know that we should wait and listen for his direction, but too often we want to offer him help in fulfilling those plans. See, patience is a virtue that few of us have. But if only we would exercise a little bit, then spiritual renewal will be ours as we engage with God. And if Philip Brooks, great preacher, who was known to be a man of poise and patience, but he was also known to have times of real frustration. And one day a friend went to visit him and he was just pacing up and down like a caged animal. And he said, what is wrong with you? He said, oh, the trouble is I'm in a hurry and God isn't. We all feel like that, don't we? We want it and we want it now. And that's a mark of our society too. I remember when we first got married, we were given sticks for furniture. Mary's dad actually got a three-piece cottage suite that bolted together, you know. And um, Mary's mum re-upholstered the cushions and, and put the strapping on. Mary's dad rubbed it all down and re-varnished it. It was great, you know. And it's the most uncomfortable thing you ever sat on. But we had a three-piece suite. The dog loved it. <laughs> but, you know, as we went on, we gradually built it up and built it up. Nowadays, what happens? Oh, you go to a wedding. Oh, you get a, you get a list, don't you? Now, our list, our wedding list, was a, one of these secretaries' notepads. you remember those? And um, what you used to put on this, well, we did an iron, flipped over, ironing board, flipped over, and we went through it like that. So when people would look at it, they passed around the pad, and people said, oh, I'll get them an iron, or an ironing board, or whatever. In fact, we still got the ironing board, it was my grandmother's, and uh, we've still got that 30 odd years later. There's nothing wrong with it. A bit rusty, but... <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays... You go to a wedding, what, well, okay, have you got your wedding list? Oh, if you just go online um, to John Lewis, <laughs> and we've picked out what we would already like. What is that all about? You know, but spiritually we're doing exactly the same thing, you know. We pick and choose, like we're going to John Lewis. 
And I say, no, Lord, I don't want that sort of spirituality. That's the sort I want. I don't, no, I don't want to read my Bible every day. No, no, I, I can fit you in between ten half past, as that sort of thing, and five and five thirty just for tea. Oh, one of my favourite programmes on. I can't, I can't fit you in there. And church, oh, no, I can't go to Beacon Off. You know, they haven't got any musicians, you know. You know, they, they've got music projected on the wall. It's all very nice, but, you know, it's not the thing. And do you know, they're all old people, <laughs> including the pastor. So I'm getting that in quick. <laughs> There's no children there. Oh, no, I can't take our kids there. No, we can't do that. And anyway, they'd expect me to give a lot of money, wouldn't they? No, I can't do that. Well... And you know the story about the money, do you? But the money was talking to each other. Yeah. And, the two, and the two 50 pound notes were talking to each other. He says, where you been this week? He said, oh, amazing. He said, I've been to France. He, oh, I was in Rio. Really? He said, yeah. And he said, oh, Germany. And then when he went around there, he come down to the 10 pound note. And he said, what about you? He said, oh, not been bad, actually. He said, I've been down to um, a nice fancy restaurant in London there and one in Edinburgh. I was, oh, that's very good. So they got the five pound. Now, what about you? Oh, I've been to news agents. Um, and I bought cigarettes and I've done this. All uh, oh, right, I said to the pounder, what about you then? Where you been? He says, oh, you know, the same old usual. Church, church, church. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Christian, I think our problem is that we want to pick and choose too much. We don't want to wait on God. We want God to work to our plan. And what he wants us to do is just to listen. He wants us to wait. And he wants us to commit. See, power comes to those who wait upon God's timing. What does he say in his word? I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. For evil doers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for me. These all look at you to give them food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are, dis- they are satisfied with good things. See, the disciples didn't know exactly when or how God will put this plan into action. But he was going to make the announcement at the proper time. And we've got to wait for that too. Let's pray. Now, Father, when we think back to those exciting days for the disciples, and sure as they reflected throughout their lives on all the things that happened, I'm sure they had a good laugh. And they remembered the sense of awe. They remembered their impatience. They remembered a sense of no peace and the fear that held them. But we thank you too that you gave them the enduring memory and the experience that continued of the presence of your spirit that empowered them to be the very best they could be. For the way that you changed them and took the very best of who they were and enhanced them so that they would change the world. And we thank you, Lord, for that witness of your spirit that has taken this gospel until now. And we thank you that we have been changed by it too. Help us to understand that we need to commit to that that we've got to stop treating you like some kind of spiritual supermarket, but we've got to trust you for who you are and accept the fact that you see us as we are. Help us, we pray, to trust you with all of our heart and to wait upon your plan that we might bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.